So our next speaker is Dr. Ellen Haynes, uh, and she's going to talk about an emerging fungal disease in wild and captive snakes. And Dr. Haynes comes from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. Thank Great. you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited uh, to learn more about this fungal disease. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thank you everybody for joining in virtually um, from wherever everybody is. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about aphidiomycosis, um, which many of you may have uh, heard referred to as snake fungal disease. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of context about why are we worried about wildlife disease? Um, we live in a time when human activities have significantly impacted the global landscape. And this is to such an extent that the term Anthropocene has been suggested to describe the current um, geological error to, to say that human activities are such a, uh, an impact on the global landscape. And so this has a lot of implications, a lot of impacts on wildlife. Uh, we've talked about habitat destruction, uh, climate change, and even influencing the spread of pathogens both uh, between wild animals as well as between wildlife, domestic animals, and people. And we're particularly concerned about emerging wildlife diseases. Um, these have been implicated in population declines and even extinction events, which result in a loss of global biodiversity. And we're particularly concerned about um, emerging fungal diseases. So um, one example is chytridiomycosis, which impacts amphibians and has caused massive die-offs of amphibians worldwide. Another fungal, emerging fungal disease is white-nose syndrome, which affects bats. Um, and ophidiomycosis is a fungal disease that affects snakes. So this is probably not a question that a lot of people uh, at this conference have, but I think it's really important to specifically address why are snakes important? Um, snakes help to maintain healthy ecosystems in a number of ways. They're um, important in helping to control zoonotic diseases as generalist predators that control populations of small mammals. Um, and small mammals serve as reservoirs for zoonotic diseases that can be passed from uh, wildlife to um, people. Um, some of the zoonotic diseases include hantavirus and Lyme disease. And the picture on the right side of the slide here shows the transmission cycle of Lyme disease, which involves ticks as well as several wildlife reservoirs. And the role of the snakes is that they eat the mice. And so that prevents Lyme disease from being um, transmitted as much to people and protects uh, human health. Snakes also are important in maintaining food webs, both as predators and as prey items. Um, and their presence in an ecosystem promotes overall biodiversity, which increases ecosystem health and productivity. So to get a little bit more into aphidiomycosis, um, as I mentioned, this is also known as snake fungal disease or SFD for short. And um, it's an emerging disease of snakes worldwide. Cases in wild snakes have been identified in uh, North America, um, including the United States and Canada, as well as in Europe. And cases in captive or managed snakes um, are in all of these areas, as well as extending into the United Kingdom and Australia. Um, the disease, uh, so this map shows the current distribution of aphidiomycosis in the United States in pretty much every state east of the Mississippi River, um, as well as in several states in the Southwest, as well as in California. Um, the disease has been reported to affect more than 30 species of snakes. And studies have shown that all species are susceptible to the disease, regardless of their lifestyle or taxonomic group. The disease does impact species of conservation concern, um, including timber rattlesnakes, eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes, and um, eastern indigo snakes. And it's caused by the fungus Ophidiomyces ophidicola. This is a fu fungus in the order Onogenellus. Um, this order includes other fungi that cause um, skin and shell disease in reptiles. Um, including Nenesiopsis, which is a fungus that causes skin disease in bearded dragons. Um, Amidomyces is a fungus that causes shell disease in aquatic turtles. And Paranenesiopsis causes skin disease in snake species, mostly aquatic snakes like tentacled snakes. And so this fungus, Aphidiomyces, can persist in the soil over a wide range of temperatures and pH, uh, which makes it long-lived in the environment. And it's keratinophilic, meaning that it targets uh, tissues that have keratin in them. And so this makes it a really good opportunistic pathogen to affect snakes, especially snake skin, which contains a lot of keratin. 
So the transmission of this fungus is not fully understood at this point, um, but we do think that it um, involves contact between infected snakes or contact with soil that has the fungus in it. Um, and it may also occur between the mother and offspring at birth um, in species that give birth to live young. The clinical presentation of disease, so what, is, what do snakes look like that have aphidiomycosis? Um, a lot of snakes, some snakes will show general signs such as lethargy, just not, not seeming right, not moving around as much, or having shedding issues as shown in the top picture here. The classic presentation for aphidiomycosis involves skin lesions. Um, and these can vary from raised or discolored scales um, to necrotic scales as shown in the middle picture on the left in that white circle. Um, these can also, um, snakes also have pustules or granulomas, which are larger, more raised lesions on the skin. Snakes can, can have crusts, which are shown in the middle picture on the right. And um, a lot of times we see these crusts uh, fall off the snake, revealing an underlying ulcer as shown in that bottom picture. And so the distribution of lesions can be anywhere on the body. It can be on the head, the dorsal body, the ventral body, the tail. Um, and while they are typically limited to the skin, um, in some cases we have seen um, that fungus will invade into deeper tissues like muscle or bone. And there have been reports of um, internal disease, so fungus growing in internal organs such as the lungs and liver and kidneys. There are quite a few uh, secondary implications of infection. Um, snakes can get secondary bacterial or other fungal infections at the site of these lesions. Um, and snakes can be impacted um, more severely if lesions are on the face or on, on the cloaca. So um, lesions that affect the eyes or the mouth can impact an animal's ability to feed or to evade predators and uh, lesions on the cloaca can impact their ability to uh, produce urates or feces or to give birth or to reproduce. And so while in many cases we see animals surviving with this disease, in more severe cases, it can be fatal. These are some additional um, lesions that we see. Um, we see fungal infections involving the eyes. We see swelling of the neck. Um, a lot of lesions affecting the face, including ulceration of the front of the face or the rostrum. Um, or crusting of the face in, um, in some cases. And then um, on the far right, a picture of a jaw deformity in a case where the fungus invaded the bone of the jaw. And so moving on from what does the disease look like to how do we diagnose this disease? So we have a snake that we're wondering if maybe it has aphidiomycosis, maybe it has some blotchiness on its skin like this snake does. Um, there's two different ways that we can collect a sample um, to um, diagnose the presence of this fungus. The first way is to collect a skin biopsy. So this is a more invasive technique that's gonna require anesthesia and probably a veterinarian um, who has the, the, the training required to collect this um, sample. And a skin biopsy can be submitted to the lab for uh, DNA extraction and qPCR, which will detect the presence of fungal DNA in the sample. Biopsy can also be submitted for histopathology which examines the tissues and uh, looks for the presence of fungus in the snake's tissues. And a skin biopsy can be used for fungal culture, and that's gonna detect live infectious growing fungus in the sample. And fungal culture typically takes about three to six weeks to get results. If we're not able to uh, do such an invasive sample, we don't think that's appropriate in a particular situation, we can also collect a skin swab. So this involves passing a sterile cotton tip applicator uh, rubbing it all over the snake's body um, to try and pick up some, some fungus. And we can submit this for fungal culture as well, or we can do DNA extraction and qPCR on that swab to detect fungal DNA. So a couple of different options for diagnosis. And so we've developed a couple of different ways to describe disease. Um, we're still learning a lot about this disease and trying to describe what we're seeing in different snakes and snake populations. And so we've developed these aphidiomycosis categories, um, which are based on physical exam findings. So whether or not lesions are present on a snake's skin um, and the qPCR results. So that's something we've, um, that we can get from either a skin uh, biopsy or our skin swab. And so the negative aphidiomycosis category indicates that an animal does not have any lesions and was negative on qPCR. Um, if an animal has, uh, does not have lesions, but they test positive on qPCR, we call that having aphidiomyces present. Uh, the category possible aphidiomycosis um, means an animal has lesions, but tested negative on qPCR. 
And then apparent aphidiomycosis um, indicates the animal both has lesions and tested positive on qPCR. So that's sort of our most definitive disease, um, but the other categories describe other things that we uh, find quite commonly in different snake populations. And then we've developed this disease severity scoring system to quanti quantitatively um, compare disease severity either over time or between individuals. Um, I would caution against using the scoring system to compare snakes of different species because the disease presentation can be so different um, between species. And so the scoring system has four categories. Um, it's based on the type of lesion that are present, the location of the lesions on the body, the number of location, or, sorry, the number of lesions the snake has, and how big they are. And so depending on um, the characteristics of in each of those categories, snakes can receive between one and three points in each of the four categories. And then you add those up to get their total disease severity score. And so now that we've sort of covered aphidiomycosis generally, um, I wanted to specifically talk more about what's been done with this disease in Michigan. And so aphidiomycosis is present in Michigan. It was first detected in two Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes from Grayling um, in 2013. And so these snakes were part of a radio telemetry study that was being conducted. Um, and they were captured in June, 2013 initially. And then um, they were monitored over time um, because they had radio telemeters placed in them. And so the first snake um, developed jaw misalignment and then was lethargic and had difficulty shedding and developed crusty facial lesions over the period of a couple of months. And then the second snake um, developed a pustule on the side of the face, which is shown in the top picture here. Um, and then also had lesions on the neck, dorsal body and tail shown in the bottom picture. So both of these snakes um, had skin biopsies performed and these were submitted um, to my lab at the University of Illinois to confirm the presence of Ophidiomyces aphidiocola uh, with using qPCR. Um, and so based on the conservation concern for, for Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes and the severity of disease in both of these snakes, they were brought into captivity and treatment was attempted, um, but unfortunately was unsuccessful and both snakes died in captivity. And um, the fungal infection of both skin and muscle was confirmed on postmortem exam or necropsy. And so um, another study that's been published um, out of Michigan was um, continued the, so I said there was a radio telemetry study being performed at Camp Grayling. And this study continued from 2013 to 2017 um, and tracked uh, infected and, and healthy Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes um, at this site. And so they found that um, infected snakes were um, less active. So they moved longer distances less frequently and were less visible. So this suggests that there's an energetic cost to being infected with this disease that makes snakes wanna move around less. Um, and the energetic costs comes from the immune response needed to fight off the infection. And so another finding from this um, study was that the monthly body temperature of infected snakes differed from uninfected snakes only near the end of the active season. So um, as summer turned into fall and temperature started to decline, the um, infected snakes tend to, tended to stay above ground and bask more frequently um, compared to, in fact, the infected snakes were basking more um, compared to uninfected snakes. Um, and this is likely due to them trying to keep their body temperature up so that their metabolism would stay higher um, and they would have a better immune response um, to the fungal infection. And then finally, um, the study found that most infected individuals tended to overwinter in a concentrated area, which suggests that there may be a um, environmental hotspot for this fungus. Um, and then another study that has been done with the, these Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes in Michigan um, was conducted at three different sites between 2014 and 2017. Um, and I've shown the three sites on the map here. So the first site uh, was the Edward Lowe Foundation. The second was the Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. And then the third site was Camp Grayling, that's the northernmost site. And so um, comparing the prevalence of both lesions and qPCR positive results for aphidiomyces across these sites, um, the prevalence of skin lesions varied from zero to 61%. Um, and the prevalence of qPCR positive results varied from zero to 13.3%, depending on site. And so the prevalence of aphidiomyces um, was higher at Camp Grayling compared to other two sites. And this was thought 
to be potentially due to a lower local temperature. And then the study also looked at um, the likelihood of detecting disease in animals um, based on different sampling techniques and different uh, disease presentation. And so um, they collected a variety of different numbers of swabs of, of different animals and found that increasing the number of swabs collected reduced the likelihood of a false negative result. So you were more likely to detect fungus the more swabs you collected. Um, and this is shown in the graph on the right side. And then um, snakes with more lesions were more likely to be qPCR positive. Um, so you're more likely to detect fungus if the snakes had um, lesions present. And so based on these findings, they made a couple of recommendations for future monitoring. They recommended um, repeatedly sampling snakes, so collecting at least five or more swabs per snake um, in order to make your best chance of, of detecting the fungus if it's present, um, and then increasing the sample size um, for future surveillance efforts, so including at least 40 individuals per locality to really accurately estimate the local prevalence of Ophidiomyces DNA. And so now I'd like to move on and talk about um, some of the studies and the papers that have come out of my lab recently. Um, so this paper was just published last month um, and is authored by one of the vet veterinary students in my lab, Katie Viverito. Um, and this was done in Lake Erie water snakes um, in Ohio. So I'd like to thank our collaborators at the Ohio Division of Wildlife and at Ohio State University. And so um, what the study did is we looked at ultraviolet fluorescence. So shining a UV light on snakes um, found that it could be a really good screening tool for detecting lesions that are consistent with ophidiomycosis. And so we put, uh, we put snakes in a box and we shone a UV light on them and we found that the lesions fluoresced under UV light. So in the pictures here um, on the left is a snake with fluorescence above its eye. So there's a lesion above its eye. And then in the picture on the right hand side, um, that snake's tail is covered in lesions, which are all fluorescing in that uh, sort of light green color. And so one clarification here is it's not the presence of fungus that's fluorescing, it's the reaction between the fungus and the tissue that it's invading that's causing the fluorescence. Um, and interestingly, this um, fluorescence has, has also been described in bats with white nose syndrome, so lesions on their wings, um, and in plants that have fungal infection. So this is a cool way that we can quickly identify lesions on a snake's body um, to target areas for additional testing, so um, to target your skin swabbing or your, or your skin biopsy. Um, and and to, to use those diagnostic techniques to actually detect the presence of the fungus and confirm that this is a pheomycosis in these snakes. And then the second report um, came out this year as well. This was a collaboration with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the UC Davis Vet School One Health Institute. Um, and we published the first report of ophidiomycosis um, in the state of California, as well as in the species of the California king snake. And so um, it seems like every, everywhere we look for this disease, we find it. Um, and, and we're constantly identifying new host species and new geographic areas. So still a lot to learn and still more work to be done to figure out what is the real distribution of this disease. And so um, another project that um, was recently published um, was a large scale surveillance of ophidiomycosis um, in the state of Georgia. And this was a collaboration with the Orian Society, um, specifically targeting um, Eastern indigo snakes um, in, in the long leaf pine uh, ecosystems in Georgia, and but was a multi-species study. Ellen, and I'm just so, gonna give you a verbal five minute warning. That's all. Great. So. All right, we will speed things up. Thank you. Um, and so through this, this study, we identified five new host species, again, finding new hosts constantly. And then we were able to find some taxonomic associations with disease. So this is a, a fancy network um, that shows when you link um, species of snakes with ophidiomycosis categories, we can start to see some trends of what species might be more heavily impacted by this disease. And then another large scale surveillance study um, was done in collaboration with the Department of Defense. So we uh, worked with military installations to go out and swab snakes on these lands. Um, and again, we identified some new host species and also some new geographic areas of the distribution. So this is a map of the study area. Um, all the areas that are shaded in any gray were surveyed and the snakes, um, sorry, the states in the darker gray 
were areas that had positive detection of ophidiomyces. Um, specifically, the areas with asterisks were areas that were detected with ophidiomycosis for the first time. Um, so that was in Idaho, Oklahoma, and Puerto Rico. And then we used uh, a similar network analysis to look for associations between geographic area and ophidiomycosis category. Again, just a way to visually evaluate the data. Um, and again, for the most part, we're seeing a, a pretty big mix of ophidiomycosis categories um, in different geographic areas. And then just to kind of wrap up, um, what are some of the management implications of all this information? As I said, we're still learning a lot about this disease, where it is and who it affects, and what are the population level impacts? Um, it's one of only, uh, or sorry, one of many threats to snake health. Uh, we talked about habitat uh, fragmentation, habitat destruction, climate change, um, introduction of new species and new pathogens. And so all of these work together um, to amplify the effects of infectious disease. Um, and so this disease is of added concern for threatened or endangered species um, who are already um, more susceptible to some to population declines because of all of these, these factors. Um, and overall, we just need more surveillance to figure out where this disease is and who's impacted by it and what um, factors impact its, its epidemiology. For all of us out in the field, um, working with snakes and other doing other field work, um, I would recommend doing um, doing your best to, to use really good biosecurity. So wearing gloves when you're handling snakes and either uh, cleaning your gloves or using a hand sanitizer or just changing your gloves between animals so that you're not transferring uh, fungus between animals. And then cleaning boots and equipment between sites so we're not moving soil um, that potentially has fungus in it to new sites um, and to disinfecting natural materials, materials before they're used in snake enclosures um, or just not using natural materials so that we're not bringing um, fungus and exposing um, captive snakes to, to the fungus. And then lots of future directions that we're working on. Um, we're working on a genotyping project, which will allow us to identify different strains of the, of the fungus. Uh, working on a clinical treatment trial to try and figure out how can we treat individual snakes um, as veterinarians um, that have this disease. And then working on ways to improve our environmental detection so we can figure out where this fungus is and, and how concentrated it is in the environment. So with that, I'd like to thank all my funding sources and um, all the students in the Wildlife Epidemiology Lab who help with make all this work possible. Um, you're welcome to follow us on social media. We have a great social media coordinator that posts, posts fun things on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. We've got lots of great questions in the Q&A. Okay. I don't even know where to start, um, but I'll start <laughs> with one. Uh, so is there a genetic analysis or a study of old museum specimens that could help us determine how long the disease has been in North America? Has anyone done any of that? There is some work, yeah. So the first, um, the oldest isolate of ophidiomyces in the US was from um, New York, and I believe it was 1985. Um, and that was from a museum specimen. So, um, and we can definitely go back and, and analyze um, preserved snakes um, to, to find the fungus. And, and that, in that case, we are finding um, right historical cases and trying to identify how long the disease has been here and kind of whether this is a truly emerging disease or just one that we're finally looking for. Or maybe that's getting worse because of other factors. In terms, a great point. in terms of identification, uh, Jennifer was asking, did you find any areas that fluoresced where the lesions weren't obvious without the UV? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, I'm I've been doing this for, for a while and I'm pretty good at finding lesions, but even to my eye, um, there are some subtle lesions that we can pick up with the UV fluorescence, absolutely. So there are a few questions about what the general public can do. And you kind of answered that a little bit of cleaning things um, but how far does outreach span for educating the public and field workers uh, researching these habitats? For example, can researchers seek training to identify the disease severity or learn how to collect swabs and skin, excuse me, skin scrapes with safe handling? Is there any of that type of training for, for more of the public? Um, we, a lot of our public outreach is, is things like this, where you know, we're reaching out to folks who are, are interested in herpetology um, and trying to educate them about what the disease looks like. Um, and in cases where you, know, you maybe find a snake who looks suspicious, and we recommend you know, contacting the, the land managers for that area um, and then having them um, 
either reach out to a local veterinarian to pursue testing or to you're welcome to contact me or um, my boss, Dr. Matt Allender. Um, we're always happy to work with folks to, to process samples and, and to, uh, to figure out you know, what's going on with a particular snake. We don't, you know, we're not encouraging everyone to go out and start swabbing snakes because unfortunately it's not free to run these swabs. Um, but certainly if there are areas where snakes are not looking so hot, if they're looking like there's a lot of disease, then, then maybe there's, we should start doing some more surveillance and we can certainly work with land managers to make that happen. Awesome. Um, Anne asks, are there variances in the Massasaugas in the Northern regions of other states that are quantifiable? Do you see this pattern in Illinois and Wisconsin also? And how many Massasaugas have been treated and released that survived? Yeah, that's a lot of good questions there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Try with you know, the first one. Uh, any variances <laughs> that are actually quantifiable? Um, so we are looking at um, aphidiomycosis in snakes in Illinois as well, um, in the southern southern population at Carlisle Lake. Um, and uh, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I know they do vary from year to year. Um, there are a couple of published reports from the first detections and then some, some subsequent surveillance um, in uh, like 2000, 10, 2015. Um, and so we know the prevalence varies over time um, and between sites, which makes it, you know, the, the, the disease progress in individual snakes over time as well. So it's, it's um, sometimes hard to know, like what's the exact prevalence of the disease in the population because it does vary over time. Um, and there has been um, some surveillance in Massasaugas in Ohio as well. Um, I, I believe that they all, all the Massasaugas in Ohio tested negative when they were surveyed, um, which is interesting. Um, Maybe different now than it was at the time of that study, unfortunately. You know, we do know that it's in uh, quite a few other snake species in Ohio. Um, and I've lost track of the other questions, if you could just It's okay. Uh, so the other question, uh, how many Massasaugas have been treated and released that survived? Great. Yes, thank you. Um, we have treated a handful. Um, unfortunately, by the time that there are things are so severe that they are brought into captivity and brought to my lab for treatment. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of them survive. Um, and the tough thing about treatment without getting into a lot of the nitty gritty details is that it takes a long time. It takes a really long time to treat fungal disease and reptiles in general, talking like months to years in some cases. Um, and so it's really tough to have wild snakes in captivity that long and then feel good about releasing them back into their habitat. Um, we have released a few Massasaugas um, that showed significant improvement during treatment. And sometimes um, the treatment is a, a nebulization. So we're putting them in a tank and then like basically misting them with a, an antifungal mist um, every day for, for up to several months. Um, there's another option to put an, an implant of the antifungal drug into the snake. So like underneath their skin and that releases more slowly over time. So in some cases, if the animal is showing good um, progress toward clearing disease, we're comfortable releasing them with an implant in, hoping that that kind of gets them over the edge where they're able to, to fend off the, to fight off the rest of the infection on their own. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's something that can be done on that. Um, last thing, like one minute left, just uh, lots of people are asking, should we encourage people to wash their shoes? I know you talked about some management things, but just reiterate, what are things that the Absolutely. average purchaser can do to stop the spread of this disease? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, when we're out hiking and you get dirt on your boots, clean off your boots before um, you get in the car, before you go to your next site, um, get, the, get that dirt off and then um, spray them with a disinfectant solution. And there's a paper that I'm happy to send folks um, that talks about some of the disinfectants that are effective against aphidiomyces. Um, the easiest thing that we use, we use a 3% bleach solution. If you spray down your boots with 3% bleach and they don't have organic material on them, that will kill the fungus. So um, spraying off any, you know, sticks that you're using for hiking, your boots, um, that'll, that'll prevent you from taking any fungus you might have picked up and bringing it to the next site where you go hiking or herping or whatever. Thank you so much. I learned so much and Great. this is an important topic. So thank you, Ellen. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.